Hi, I'm Nord Curry. You're watching Spirit of Life. Today we're speaking with Father Victor Ferrugia, who's a parish priest at St. Augustine's Church in the city. Thanks for coming in, Father. No worries, take no. This program is actually about love as its movements in our lives. So would you mind sort of setting it off by, by looking at the movement of love insofar as it led you to become a parish priest. Oh. Wow, it's going back a few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose I just landed within about two years in Australia from Malta as a migrant, and I was in between and betwixt. Mm -hmm. And I was very familiar with with church and stuff like that and I suppose my desire was either to be medical or architectural or <laughs> mm. priesthood uh, and I loved really I was in love with the fact that I could be of some good mm -hmm. to promote a gospel of love with Jesus and and to do it um, with the normal parish setups or wherever the Lord would take me in that sense. Mm -hmm. So anything to do with being with people in their journey kind of interested me really yeah. uh, in, in the first place. Yeah, so it, it, it was attractive to me to know mm -hmm. that I could spend my life being with others and being for others, you know, in that right. sense. Yeah. Uh, would that be based on, on well, Malta is, when in those days was one of the most Catholic places in the world. Yes. W was that because you were sort of raised in that context? You, you really had that as a foundation? Yes, in, in Malta, the, the definitely at that stage, I'm talking back in the 50s, 60s, mm. um, religion was part of life. Yeah. Really. It wasn't even like... Um, being promoted or and it pushed, it was mm. very closely well knitted within our social life as well, yeah. and other connectedness, mm. um, boys club was from the local church, and mm. so there was a social aspect to it, and the priests in Malta back then, uh, I don't know now, but back mm. then. Uh, they were very much close to the people, mm, mm. Uh, you know, and, and so there was a normality about taking on yeah. that vocation. Yeah. Um, but certainly the thought that I could be of some use to someone, um, yeah. probably underneath it all, gave me the great motivation to start that. Mm. And just speaking about that, as you're speaking, is there one particular instance which comes to mind where you, you said, ah, this is the love that, I, that I'm seeking, this is the, the service to love that I'm seeking. Was there a moment like that? Hmm. Well, I remember as a little boy, hmm. um, I was going to my second time for, com for confession. Mm -hmm. And in Malta, normally you'd go to the sacristy and we had a visiting Franciscan actually mm. and I don't know what this man he had something very beautiful mm. there was an inviting smile and I really almost was teary going to my second confession now you could imagine right. uh, an eight year old well, wouldn't have that many stuff to say <laughs> you know <laughs> you have that. but the way in which he really welcomed me and mm. opened to say you know that, well, there was that real cordiality and and uh, he he could see I was a bit nervous and you know, teary and stuff, and but there was a, a lovely humanity there. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know. It, it was part of sowing seeds. Mm -hmm. um, I could also say that we had a bit of clergy in the families on both sides. Yeah. So it, it was kind of not unusual for me or any Maltese boy to think 
about mm. becoming a priest. No. Uh -huh. But um, something kept working like mm. inside of me. And when yeah. we came to Australia, then I, I had to make a decision, you mm. know. Mm. And it, I was encouraged by the then Joa Bella, who was part of the museum. Mm. Um, and some of the priests you know, really were close to us, even growing up, you see. Yeah. So all that kind of blended together, if you like, in saying, well, this is a good mm. way to mm. um, to dedicate my life. Yeah. And you make a very good point because uh, we go back 30, 40 years, um, the relationship of the church, in this case, the Catholic Church, to the community was a lot different to what it is now. And so oh, to yes. look at it through today's eyes, uh, it's difficult to to connect with the fact that, as you said, it was sort of natural for a, a young Maltese uh, child who's gone through all of that. The Catholic Church is sort of an integral part of their sense of family. Yeah, very much so, yeah. So, uh, and in the little town where we were, if there was a funeral, we all knew just mm. listening to the bells, whether mm. it was a male or a female, or whether they, they were going, the priest was on the way to the house, uh, yeah. Instead of the mobile, we had yes. the local church bells. Yeah. And so yeah. they told us when it was six o'clock in the morning or mm. 12 o'clock or whatever. Mm. So there was a whole, I suppose, weaving. Absolutely. It was a weaving inside mm. the very social life mm. as well as um, growing up in that it, sense. It, yeah. It's a fabric, isn't it? It's part of the fabric. Very much so, yeah. As is time, and we're out of that for the moment. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Spirit of Life. And we're speaking with Father Victor Ferrugia. Father, you mentioned about um, the context of Malta, but just looking into the context of priesthood, and we're talking about the connection with love here, can you give us a bit of an insight into how that influences a priest when they identify with the fact that in that moment they are the connection with the great divine essence of love itself. What sort of impact does that have? Hmm. Um, that awareness was there as I went through the seminary, this mm. tremendous awareness of identifying with the love of God. Mm. And I remember that I was conscious of that in my own mm. life. Mm. The second Sunday that I was celebrating Mass, the church was full. And I remember, I remember looking at the people and inside of me I was saying, but you've got what I've got. Mm. As if to say, don't look over here. You, 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 you've got, uh, and I was referring to this connectedness, you see, yes. or in love. Yeah. Um, and I, it's as if now, like, I felt, well, you've all got this, you see. Yes, yeah. uh, so in other words, forget about priests or being up or down, hierarchy or whatever. It, it, we're all in this together, you see. Mm. And, and that experience was, was a, a little aha moment, if you like. Yeah. But it mm. kept penetrating, permeating mm. right through my life as a priest and yeah. became even stronger as I grew older, right. would you believe? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that that my hmm, I, I framed my own ministry, my, the mm. ministry as a priest, more like um, that I was a rag, mm -hmm. Aladdin's lamp. That yeah. Aladdin would rub rub the lamp, and yeah. out would come the genie. Yeah. And I saw myself as that rag. I said, yes. "Well, I'm in the hands of God, rubbing people's life in a sense to draw them into love and to." forgiveness yeah. into self-forgiveness or whatever whatever aspect of love you know that um, 
so many people you know, look for in a sense that I was almost like a midwife you know I was there to mm. to facilitate that and that came later on when I eventually got into spiritual direction mm. Mm. it became more obviously so totally convinced of people's own already yeah. story of love inside of them but um, I was there to listen attentively with them yeah to that calling of love and to encourage them to listen and to accept it and then step out of the room and let let them and God, so to speak, you know, talk Work to each out. other. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's very powerful. That's a powerful insight and, and an identity with, uh, with the role, but also the identity with the universality of love, as, as you say. Mm. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So <laughs> what am I doing? But the, the point is that you, you have done it and being familiar with some of your past, uh, you've done it very energetically and very effectively. So as you sit here now and you say, okay, the, the issue clearly is love, are there some examples that you can point to um, where you've seen transformations of people either coming from, and there's no such thing as no love, but coming from, from the absence of effective love to effective love? <laughs> Where do you want me to start? There'll be a few of those, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, right. that's right. Look, some, some stand out, obviously. Mm. I remember talking to this man. He was, he was a tremendous victim of war, where mm. his, his mother died in the war, and mm. his father remarried again, and he was just a baby. So yes. he, giving birth to him, his mother died. Yes, yes. And the, the, the new wife just did, did not want to even consider him. She never touched him, mm. you know. And I'm talking to him when he's turning 77 or something. Yes. And somehow or other he must have arrived at that time mm. to look at this. Mm. And I'm never surprised by that because those things keep waiting in the aisle until we deal with them, you see. Yes. Yes. or they deal with us <laughs> and uh, I remember the moment we opened up and I just listened to him and he started and then at some stage there was this complete he broke down this tall um, he was European background you know and this tall man just crumpled mm -hmm. on the floor crying his heart out and we stood there for at least 20 minutes where he just could not stop Good. crying yes. Yes. And for the first time, he allowed love, some or other, to touch him in some way, just by having yeah. the opportunity to tell his story and stuff, you see. Mm. And uh, I was so moved, you know, I thought, gosh, there you are. The pain was as fresh as, yeah. and him waiting to find the right opportunity to be in touch with it and start moving beyond it, so to speak, you see. So it was, it was in, in that circumstance, it was love in, in that way. You know, there's mm. other movements, of course, you know. Mm. But that, that then comes down to, and you mentioned spiritual direction before, but the power of story. And, and, and story is only good, as good as the capacity for it to be heard by someone else. Yes. And yes. so that was what drove that. It, it, amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yes. So you. Love, love is a, uh, as well I think most people would agree, but certainly I, I realise that, uh, that of you, that you agree with this is, as you said before, that it's the constant, it's the permanent. There is no, no other. There's the permanent of love itself. And so you give an example of that, that guy. Uh, families. Families are places where if love is going to be broken, that's yeah. where it'll be broken. That's right. That's right. So I wonder if you could, without naming names, of course, is give some sort of an idea of coming into a scenario with a family where the brokenness of the love there was enough to, for you to say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this? So before you go, though, we're out of time. So oh. think about it so your answer's much better. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment.
Welcome back. You're watching Spirit of Life and we're speaking with Father Victor Ferugia. Father, we had a little discourse before the break mm -hmm. about family and I just wondered if you could give us an idea of how you walk into a family situation and the broken love is just so clear. What, what do you need to look for as the thread? What's the first thread you seek to hold on to, mm. to start to pull it together? If it's, if it's possible, it may not mm. be possible, but that's where you start. What's the thread you look for? Good question. I often say that the word God, the G-O-D, is the ground of definition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when I walk into a family where the word family disappears because they're not defined by love, mm -hmm. I have to really be very, very attentive as to where the source of mm. that broken down mm. situation, who's contributing to that. Yeah, yeah. And each situation is different. Mm. But in my manner of listening, in my manner of looking, I'm always looking for the one who somehow or other maybe is being misunderstood or yeah has lost the way of being able to connect, yeah. you know. Um, uh, obviously, it's a lot of work sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes you have to work with one particular member if that's yeah. uh, causing the, the rifts in the family. Sometimes uh, they're trying to do something about something that's been going for a long time, you know, yeah. but, but too little, almost too late. Yeah. Um, I certainly know that being the hierarchical, pushing, po uh, pointing my finger and all this, that none of that's going to work. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I've come to believe that it's in the manner of me staying, in a sense, in that love and allowing that love to reveal to me which person I can work with. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe inviting him or her to take time out and and do it bit by bit. It's very hard to really uh, generate anything when the whole group is dead, each other's throat. Sometimes yes. sometimes one has to accept that, you know, people are beyond repair in yes. terms of love, you see. Yeah. And that's very sad, but... But it's also a reality, yeah. yeah. yeah it, they can, you know, we, uh, we can make a heaven out of hell or hell out of heaven. That's the... That's yeah. the Yes, human, it's, it's human true. Yes. Know, paradox, really. So, so bro broken love uh, often rests on uh, lack of trust. So, would that be how would you establish the, like this individual of, or well, there might be two, but usually it'd be an individual. It's a matter of establishing trust with them so that they can sort of come to you and speak with you in areas perhaps they've never gone before. It's, uh, even before trust, sometimes, mm -hmm. um, I often say with married couples when I'm preparing for marriage with them, yeah. I say, look, I'm gonna make it extremely simple. I said, the moment you take each other for granted, mm -hmm. the rot begins to set in. Mm -hmm. And that applies to me as a priest, to my own friendships, to my own prayer life. Mm. Um, and I say, well, you know, where is it? Who's taking for granted who? Mm. Who's presuming what, yeah. you see? Yeah. And I often start from that angle, if you like, mm. so that uh, I don't complicate it too much. Mm. At weddings, I'll often say, well, look, you're either eating or you're starving. Yeah. You never stop in the middle. No. And so you're either building your marriage, or if you're not doing that, you're building your divorce. Uh, yeah, and the key yeah. to all that is the presence of love, yeah. really. That people think the, the opposite of love is hatred. It's yeah. not. No. The opposite of love really is apathy. 
As the Greek yeah. would say, apatos, without any feeling, you know, yeah. whether you're there or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Now, sometimes it sounds very subtly, mm. um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's mainly locating who's taking who for granted. Yeah. Yeah. who's presuming things mm. and, pre and the presumption being a wrong one and you know so it builds very much like that so I'm mm. looking for that really. Yeah yeah that's that's a very uh, a very interesting way to go because it, it is about uh, neglect of, and it can be neglect of quite small things too. Yes don't they? absolutely. They, they will, they can, yeah. uh, it can become yeah. very subtle you see it can yeah. be very subtle and and then stuff is not talked about and mm. it grows bigger than Ben Hur, you see. Yes. So yes. Well, well, coming back to that uh, very good example you gave of the fellow who collapsed in in absolute uh, emotional mm. agony uh, from neglect. D it, do you see that there's um, and this is a big question? I probably shouldn't ask it at this stage of the interview, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> that we're we're young kids can you see a, a change in the way in which young children in a family regard love are they more outgoing more loving or is there a withdrawal to an internal internalization of selfishness in other words yeah look in some families i see some terrific openness yeah and real communication mm. and real listening Mm. Um, but then in others, um, you know, we used to say sin, stuck in narcissism. For me, <laughs> sin really is me, myself and I. And yeah, that's right. the people are yeah. creating institutions out of that kind mm. of way of being. People are going back to Stoicism. Mm. The Stoics were very much, so make yourself, you know, generate, nothing wrong with that, but, mm. but what are you doing that for? In order to become more loving, not not to set pedestals under one's feet. No. That eventually becomes one's tombstone, you know? Yes. Um, and so today sometimes there is, I see some young people tremendously motivated by love. Mm. Love mm. for the world, love for, you know, generosity. Um, I remember watching a group of young women who committed themselves to helping these w workers in India that work in cotton factories, a bit mm. like 19th century England, you know. Mm. But um, no, look, it, 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 to me it was, it was exhilarating to see that with young, but then, as you said, today we live in the era of me, myself and I. And we're talking time here, and we're out of time for this interview. Oh, okay. So, but I'd like to pick that up with you next week. Would you be available to, to come for an interview next week? Sure. Thanks very much, Father. Thank you. You've been watching Spirit of Life, and we will be back next week, and we'll speak to Father Victor about that interesting point you made. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.